This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and during its long and rich history Africa gave birth to a wide range of different weapons. This diversity was due to the numerous environmental and climatic conditions that shaped the nature of African warfare, influencing arms, deployment and strategy. Pair that with the geomilitary distribution of warfare in pre-colonial Africa, the different kinds of terrain the warriors had to fight in. Savannas of the West Sudan, ideal for the use of cavalry, are different from the extensive savannas of Central Africa, where reconnaissance had to be done on foot. The great tropical rainforests of West Africa, impossible for horses, so tangled by trees and undergrowth that a warfare of ambush and position channeled into fairly fixed locations was the norm. Finally, the lands with denser populations of peasants living along rivers and coastal regions where again an entirely different scenario appears. On this list we'll see Africa's top 10 weapons rated from the less peculiar to the most unique and bizarre one, so stick until the end to see some really interesting stuff. Number 10. The Egyptian Spear. In the Old and Middle Kingdom, the blade of these spears was made of copper or flint and were attached to the shaft by a tang. In the New Kingdom, bronze blades attached through a sockets were more common, and eventually they started to be made of iron. The spear was usually intended to be thrown at the enemy. In a way, it holds similarity with the famous Asegai, a sort of spear slash javelin with a narrow 5 inches blade used almost everywhere in Africa, with the Zulu, Xhosa, and Nguni people of South Africa being renowned for their use. But there was also a type of halberd, a spear shaft fitted with an axe blade that was used instead. Number 9. The Zulu Ikwa the Asegai throwing spear was replaced with a short and sturdy ikwa designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat, allegedly by Shaka himself. The ikwa is a short stabbing spear with a 14 inches double-sided razor-sharp iron blade mounted on a 24 inches shaft. Its name derived from the sucking sound that was heard when the weapon was withdrawn from a victim's wound. It was one of the main weapons used during the famous battle of Isandlawana on the 22nd of January 1879, the first major encounter in the Anglo-Zulu War between the British Empire and the Zulu Kingdom. The nature of the wound produced by the massive blade probably meant that few, if any, survived and it was perfect for the kind of engagement tactics used by the Zulu, aimed at direct physical contact with the enemy. The Impengula resembled the Zulu Ikwa, but it was used by the Ila people, an ethnic group in the Republic of Zambia. Number 8. Takouba. The Takouba very often surprises those who haven't spent much time researching African weapons. Having broad, straight double-edged blades averaging 74 to 84 centimeters in length and a simple cross guard usually covered in leather, the Takouba resembles medieval European swords. There still is a lot of debate on how the weapon originated and under which influence, if European or if its early prototypical forms were actually a distinct and entirely indigenous African type. But when it comes to 16th century specimen, many will actually feature European imported blades, finished in loco with typical Takoba mountains. The typical blade tapers especially distally to a rounded point. The area within 20 to 30 centimeter of the hilt is often not sharpened. The typical blade will have three fullers but often patterns exists with a variation with five short narrow fullers. Briggs describes two forms of hilt, a southern form which has a wide guard covered in brass and thick pommel and what is called a central type having a leather covered guard and a flat pommel with a stacked pyramidal tip. And if you're interested in the topic of African history you should definitely check out the channel From Nothing. Amazing content, really cool guy. Now on this channel we often talk about how important armor is because you need to protect yourself from physical attacks. But in our day and age it is also very important to armor up your data and your files on your computer. And that is why I'd like to now talk about the sponsor that made this video possible, Surfshark VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network. What Surfshark VPN allows you to do is to keep your online identity hidden and therefore safe. This is possible because Surfshark will encrypt all the information sent 
between your device and the internet. In other words, it protects you from cyber criminals. As those of you who have been following me for a while already know, I have had recently uh, some problems with online criminals myself, as you can see on this specific video that I made about it. So from that moment on, I've been keeping up my cyber defenses and Surfshark VPN is always on on my machines. I've been using it for about six months now and together with a good dose of being careful, I haven't had any issues since, even though people tried to mess with me again. Surfshark VPN also keeps your data safe when you're using free Wi-Fi. And let me tell you, free Wi-Fi can be a goldmine for hackers, so you can never be too careful. You can also virtually travel to other countries by swapping the real location of your device with a virtual one. Surfshark has over 3,200 servers in 65 countries. Say that you are traveling and you wanted to check out a series on Netflix that is only available to people in the US. With Surfshark VPN, you can watch it no matter where you are. And you can use one account on an unlimited number of devices. So, have you been considering getting a VPN lately but you weren't sure when to do it? Well, now is your chance. Click the link in the description below right now and enter my promo code METHODRON and get an 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk to try it out. And big thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring my video. Number 7. The Egyptian Axe In Egypt, during the dynastic period, one of the most commonly used weapons was the axe. In the Old and Middle Kingdom, the axe looked like a semi-circular copper head tied to a wooden handle by cords, threaded through perforations in the copper. Even though initially there wasn't much difference between the battle axe and the woodworker's axe, eventually battle axes started to have prolonged and concave blades, narrowing down to a curved edge, possibly because those would be more adept to cutting flesh than felling trees. By the New Kingdom, the battle axe became longer, narrower and straighter, having a blade designed now for penetration. The tanked hacks that we can see here was a variation which became rather common in the Middle Kingdom and happens to be my favorite. Number six, the Ida sword. African swords are definitely underrated. The Ida is a kind of sword used by the Yoruba people of West Africa. It's basically a sword with a narrow or wide blade that can be single-edged or double-edged. These blades are typically heavier by the tip of the blade, having an elongated leaf-shaped form, which suggests a focus on cutting and hacking. During wars, peppers and poison were added to the blade. The sword could be wielded in any way, either one-handed or two-handed and were used by the Yoruba people for hunting and for war. On a similar note, we also have the Bakatwa, used by the Bantu people called Shona, which was a sort of double-edged short sword with wooden hilt and brass wire. Number 5. Rungu Nobkeri. The Iwisa, also known as Nobkeri, is a strong wooden club used in southern and eastern Africa, about two feet long, often topped with a thick knob used to crush bone. The Ndebele variant was known as Induku and is similar in design to the Zulu Iwisa. A Rungu in Swahili was also a wooden throwing club, which was known for its special symbolism and significance in certain Eastern African tribal cultures. It is especially associated with Maasai male warriors, who have traditionally used it in warfare and for hunting. Sometimes the knob or head is ornately carved with faces or other symbolic shapes. Now we know that maces have been around at least since 6000 BC in general and are probably one of the oldest weapons ever made. The Egyptians armed themselves with simple maces made of a wooden handle topped with a heavy stone head. A comparatively large number of mace heads have been excavated at late pre-dynastic and proto-dynastic sites. At first the most common shape of mace head was disc shaped, replaced by the pear shaped with longer shaft tapering towards the end. But during the New Kingdom, they improved on the deadly design with the addition of a curved blade embedded into a solid wooden head. This is what archaeologists have considered to be a distinctive Egyptian weapon referred to as a mace axe. Number 4. Kopesh The sword-like Egyptian Kopesh or Kepesh is a very peculiar kind of weapon. It featured a hooked blade sharpened on its outside edge. The semi-sickle-shaped blades were longer than daggers, and although the kopesh is commonly thought of as a sword, 
a cross-sectional view of the blade shows it had a wedge-shaped design, with only the outside of the bulging convex curve being sharpened. This would mean that these weapons are more closely associated with axes than with swords. During the New Kingdom, they are often seen replacing the traditional mace in kingly smiting scenes, being used by the king while fighting from his chariot. It is possible that this is due to the efficacy of curved blades from an elevated or mounted position. They were initially made of copper and during the New Kingdom they were cast of bronze and subsequently made of iron. A typical kopesh is 50 to 60 centimeters in length. The inside curve of the weapon could be used to trap an opponent's arm or to pull an opponent's shield away. Number 3. Nzapa Zap. The Nzapa Zap is a traditional weapon from the Upper Congo region, similar to a hatchet or an axe. The blade is made of wrought iron and is attached to a club-like wooden handle with looping prongs, often clad in copper, bronze or brass. The iron head sometimes features carvings in the shape of two to three human faces. It can be used both thrown for short distances and as a melee weapon. It was usually crafted by the Nsapo people who thrived industrially from iron and copper. The axe holds power and significance among the people since it was used in battle as a status symbol and also as form of currency in trade. Talking about axes, it's also important to mention that the Zulu, Nguni and Sotho people used triangle-shaped axes that were designed to counter the opponent's shield. Shields that were usually made of cowhide, with the hooked triangular axe also called Mbado. Number 2. Mambele. I mean, look at that! A mambele is a hybrid knife-axe weapon originating in Central and Southern Africa. The mambele consists of an iron blade with a curved back section and a spike, measuring about 22 inches in length. It can be used in close combat as a hatchet or a dagger, or more typically as a throwing weapon. It usually consists of four blades, three on the top and one on the side, but shapes will differ with region. The curved hook was used to keep the weapon in the victim, and if pulled out, it would cause even further damage. Since they were difficult to forge, they became a status symbol to their owners. Now we've got a few honourable mentions before hitting number one. Felisa, a traditional edged weapon of Algeria. Nimcha, a single-handed sword specially used in Morocco and Algeria. And now number one, Ngulu. A Ngulu is an execution sword used by the Bantu peoples, including the Ngombe, Doko, Ngala and others of the Congo Basin. They were massive blades made of iron with a non-cutting back and a semi-circular concavity. The handle, which was often surrounded by metal wire, ended with two large wooden buttons and a smaller one. It could feature one or two blades, personally the two-bladed one being an absolute epic sword in my opinion. It was used for capital executions by beheading. It being similar in purpose to the executioner's axe, the weapon wasn't designed for combat, it was cut heavy and not nimble at all. And it also had a symbol of status and prestige. Alright, noble ones, well I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, please remember thumbs up and if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Big thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and make sure to check the link in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this list, let me know what your favourite was in the comments below and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.